screen. It's gonna show, it should show on the screen, right? It's not gonna show on the screen? Okay, all right. Greetings and salutations all. Welcome to this Monday, January 23rd of 2023 uh, board meeting. Uh, we'll begin with a roll call. Mr. Atkins, please call the roll. Dr. Akbar. Mr. Alexander. Present. Ms. Autry. Present. Dr. Hall. Aye. Ms. Jackson. Aye. Mrs. McKittrick. Mr. Perry. I'm here. And we have a student board member with us, Casey Anderson. Here. Welcome, welcome, Ms. Anderson. Good to see you again. Thank you. Um, so next we're going to rise for, uh, for the pledge. Uh, Vice President Autry, would you line, uh, mind reading us in the Pledge of Allegiance today? Okay, we will proceed expeditiously to community and school reflections. Uh, who would like to start us off? Ms. Jackson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, since we last met, um, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting um, Bukto Middle as well as um, Bukto the High School officially. And it was really um, a pleasure to see school in session. I've been um, throughout the cluster multiple times this year. But um, what I was really pleased about is because I got there during transition time. And so the transitioning was happening, and all the teachers on the floor were at their doors. Um, there were people in the hallway, you know, directing the kids, okay, get to class, your time, come on, let's keep it moving. And everything was moving very smoothly. It was a very strong, positive energy. I feel like the teachers were happy to be there, you know, after, you know, dealing with the pending stress, what we just came out of. And the kids um, seemed very on point. Everything was on point. Teachers were on po pulse. Uh, the, the students were adhering to instruction to move quickly to get to their next class. And um, I was just very happy to see it. Um, I went over to the middle school side, and it was very, very calm. <laughs> extremely calm. And the reason why I say extremely calm, because as you know, I'm a middle school principal, and I'm like, now they got probably 10 times more kids than I have in my building, and it's quieter here <laughs> than it is, you know, the, the hallways were clear out. You know, of course, they had the resource officers in the hallway. Um, everyone was very nice to greet me, and the couple students that I did meet, um, they seemed excited about being at school. It was just very um, pleasant. I was very happy um, to be in the atmosphere, you know, given certain reports we may receive to see um, students and teachers connecting, being engaged with each other, and being respectable to each other. Um, I, I later talked to uh, Ms. Beecher, the building uh, campus principal, and it was, again, it was a delightful experience. So um, that's my reflection. Thank you, ma'am. Other uh, reflections? Ms. Vice President. Thank you so much, Mr. President. So since we last met, um, I had the pleasure of attending just this past Friday um, the graduation of the uh, 2023 uh, AAA uh, winter graduating class. Um, there were 13 students who graduated. It was so nice to see those families. They actually kind of packed out that auditorium um, at Firestone. Um, to have this 13 graduates. So uh, the families were very excited um, and, and proud as they should be. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank the building principal, Ms. Pelota, and the uh, academy principal, Ms. Rasnick, for, and the entire staff for all of their hard work over there at AAA. And so while I was there, there was a basketball game going, so I couldn't help but stop um, to see uh, Firestone and East playing boys basketball. Um, and, you know, I focus on sports a lot because I think that's one of our highlights in this district, to see families come out, communities come out and support these young people. It was nice to see all of the athletes, including the cheerleaders, stand in unity at half court. Um, they had a little issue with the... Uh, <laughs> the you know the national anthem but it was still nice to see um, those folks stand in unity together um, and congratulations to East uh, for winning that game um, also since we last uh, met 
Um, I was able to stop by and see girls basketball, not to discriminate. Um, Ellet versus Bukto um, at Ellet. Um, again, seeing those families coming out celebrating uh, together with the community and staff and coaches. Congratulations to those teams and congratulations to Ellet uh, for having such a good season uh, so far. Also, since we last met, I was able to witness uh, the Bookto ROTC present the colors um, for the investiture of Judge Connie Hightower, which is my sorority sister. And so it was just nice to see our young ROTC, who we've seen here many times at our meeting, um, was able to attend the Ward 5 meeting, which is our east side of Akron. Um, they had a lot of resources there. The ADM board was there. Um, we had the CEO, um, Toka Watson. She has a, a sober house uh, for women who need it. Um, she also has a leadership academy for young students for after school programming. So it was nice to talk with her. I made sure she was connected with Project Rise. Um, and so I was able to share just some of our safety updates. There was a lot of engagement going on. People want to get involved. They want to know how they can help. You know, and the quickest way for most people to help is to build relationships with your principals, with your teachers. There were folks who didn't have students. Um, but I believe we're all part of the village. So I just encourage folks to check in with their respective schools to see what the needs are at each building. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, my attendance at the Bookto PTA meeting. Um, and so that was very well attended. And uh, once again, there's lots of folks who are engaged, who want to help, who want to support. And once again, I strongly encourage someone to step up and take over the presidency <laughs> once and for all over there. Um, but you know, I don't mind it because I believe in the mission. And so it was just nice to see that. And then lastly, I just wanted to share out that the partnership with Stark State, um, that, uh, that presentation was really nice. I was honored to be there. Um, and thanks again to Stark State for just, you know, believing in our students and investing in this district. So congratulations to all involved who put that uh, together. And that's it. Roger that. Thank you. Yes. Ms. Jackson. You know, it's so much time passes that I forget places that I've been if I don't have my notes. So um, I have additional community reflections, and I realize that it's for this meeting. Oh, right. um, so I, too, attended the Bookto PTA meeting, as well as yourself and Dr. Akbar was present and uh, other community members, and I thought it was very informative. Um, I thought some things that were mentioned were, was good to know to follow up on how we can better serve our community. So I want to thank you for your work that you're doing there as well well as um, the community. Um, we had Margo Somerville was there. Um Teresa Legreer from the Akron Urban League was there. Russell Neal was there. So it was really good to see um, these pillars of our community um, coming to a school PTA meeting that's you know, vested within a community that serves a lot of the demographic that they are seeking to serve as well. So I was very encouraged by that. Additionally, um, I did have the opportunity to visit Forest Hill Elementary School. Um, I visited with Miss Blakeney, a teacher who I mentioned before, who really has um, love and passion for her students and what she's doing um, in the community. And it was a pleasure to meet with her. I just really wanted to lay eyes on this teacher who sent this email that was so caring and concerning about how was her learner going to be getting to school. She really cared about that and as far as um, the members in her community receiving certain information. Um, so I was there for a couple hours and I also met with the principal and the highlight, the principal is new to the building, but she's vested, um, she's ready to go, she's committed um, and she's ready for any challenges and I really like that. Um, and I also like that she's a believer, she's a Christian and it was clear that she was a believer. But the great part was um, that day was the first day of their school liaison that they met their school liaison. And so the same questions and concerns that she had originally, Ms. Blakeney had for us as a board. Um, I wanna thank uh, Stan C. Sykes and all those who work with making sure that we have liaisons in these buildings because all the questions were answered. 
I got an email this week from Ms. Blakeney, like, you know, just thanking us and just so excited because her school, their school liaison, who they just got, has taken care of so many of the things that she was emailing us about for her learners. So just great job, all of you who work to make sure that we have people in our buildings to help serve our students. It is making a difference, and we are impacting eternity because we're impacting their lives right now. So I want to just thank you all for all the work that you do. So that was a pleasant visit as well. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Are there any other community reflections? Yeah, please, Ms. Jackson. <laughs> uh, Mr. Alexander. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, got invited to North High School, my alma mater, and it was nice to be able to go back uh, to uh, be part of a um, assembly that they have for the students there. Again, we're talking about athletes, and it's, it's, it was really nice because there were two things that are going on. North has really never had much of a soccer team for, for years and years and years. And they have a great soccer team. They won the City Series Championship. They have some great players. There's a ton of these young, young men who are playing soccer. And uh, it's just amazing to see the melting pot of all these kids and how they relate together. It was really, really nice. And um, also, the first female tennis team to win from North High School. All females, these young ladies, you know, you look at them, you say, you wouldn't think they're, they're tennis players, but boy, when they get out there, I guess they can really play. So it was really, really nice to see that too, so to see the alma mater. And I want to thank Carrie Stewart, who is the, the uh, athletic director. She did a very, very good job of putting it together and allowing us to come there. And also, um, um, Mrs. Marcus Kearns and I were invited there because we were uh, uh, selected to be in the inaugural class of the um, Akron Public Schools Athletic Hall of Fame. So they did also honor us, which was, was a nice surprise. And they asked us to talk, which we weren't uh, expecting, didn't think we were going to talk. We thought we'd just come there to support the students, but it was really nice to, to have that happen. Uh, and also, uh, my board, junior board member, I call him, uh, Abigail Kearns is not here, and I want her to get well. I know she's sick, so I want to tell her to get well soon and that we do miss her. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, other community reflections? Sure, I'll add a couple of comments in. Um, thanks for asking. Um, thank you. All right. <laughs> um, so just a couple of notes. So yes, the Bookdale PTA meeting that, that Ms. Autry led. Um, first, I mean, kudos to you, uh, Ms. Autry. Um, you know, I, you, your presence and, um, and organization and keeping people on time and on task, I thought was exemplary. Um, especially in the face of having a who's who at that event. I mean, all the folks that were there, um, you know, I, I think Ms. Jackson mentioned all those, uh, all those dignitaries who were there and, and present. Um, and I, you know, and for me, one of the things that really jumped out was um, the willingness of parents to, to own, you know, um, when maybe their child, when maybe their children are, are not perfect, but still are involved in coming to a PTA meeting to say, hey, listen, my child's not perfect but I'm still here and I'm still engaged and I'm on my child. I just want you all to know that, um, you know, so, so I thought that was really um, one of the highlights of the meeting as well. Um, and then, uh, and I just, again, I was really just um, thoroughly um, pleased with the level of engagement and passion that you saw. And I think there was a person from another cluster that came there and was talking about how they wish that they had that kind of PTA in their cluster. And were, they, they, I think they were asking questions, I think of Ms. West, uh, who was also there, um, you know, about how do we take what's here in the Bookdale cluster and create that in other clusters as well. So I think that's, a, I, that's really um, a testimony to all of your hard work, um, you know, and so I just, I, I just want to make sure that, that we're recognizing the role that you've played and helping to build and maintain and, and, and a really solid, um, you know, uh, organization uh, in, the, in, in the Bookdale cluster. So thank you for that. Um, and then um, secondly, to Mr. Alexander's point about the North High soccer team, um, they had a decent team when I was there in the, in the 90s. Uh, I don't know about when you were there. What, 60s you were there? Last? Uh, early 60s. Oh, early 60s. OK, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Just after you left. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we kid because we love here, right? We kid because we love. Um, and um, and it, so there was a, an article in the Beacon about them maybe a year or two ago as they were just getting close and ramping up to that. Uh, and one of the things I remember from the article was that um, this team uh, of individuals, they all speak different languages. And so getting them to like be online on the field, it was amazing how they kind of crafted their own language for being on the soccer field, you know? And so I thought that was pretty spectacular. Um, and, and also too, 
um, don't uh, would not would be remiss if we didn't also add um, congratulations to you as well um, for your induction into the um, Hall of Fame. So uh, well deserved honor and, and and you know very very happy for you. Um, so uh, having said that, I I, I want to make sure that we pivot uh, to Miss Casey Anderson because I don't believe that we have any uh, requests to address the board. So let's pivot directly to you, and we'd love to hear your report. So you are reading um, Abigail Kearns from Ellet. You're, you're here to read her uh, report in this, in this up and for her tonight. But I'm happy to see you again anyway, so yeah. it's good to see you here. And so, we, so, we, while, so while we miss Ms. Kearns, we're, we're happy to have you here as well. So uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Hello, as you all know, I'm Casey Anderson. And, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Hello again. My name is Casey Anderson, and my fellow board member, Abigail Kearns, is unfortunately out ill today. And because we are a tight group, I am here to read her report. Abby is a senior at Ellet High School. She is in the hospitality pathway, and she has been accepted into the University of Akron and is a recipient of the President's Scholarship. The scholarship is worth $6,000 per school year, and she is a can candidate for the Innovation Generation Scholarship. She wants everyone to know that her bachelor's degree costs nothing. This is her third and final year serving as a student board member. Being a board member has definitely made it a lot easier for her to talk in public, and it has made it easier for her to talk to people above her. For example, she is com comfortable speaking with Superintendent Fowler Mack, and she loves working with Dr. Alexander. He was her mentor, and he would meet with her and take all her concerns seriously. Speaking of serious concerns, there have been a lot of fights and confrontations at her school, especially between the underclassmen. After COVID, students needed extra support. She has seen and experienced a lot of mental health issues happening in the schools. Students really need adults to talk to. For example, she has a strong relationship with Mrs. Hickson, her hospitality teacher. She can talk to her about anything and she, that she is struggling with. Abby has complete confidentiality with Mrs. Hickson. Students need genuine relationships with adults in, in schools that they can trust. Abby is advocating for incentives that would make Akron Public Schools more student friendly. As high school students, we are growing up and we have interests other than pizza and ice cream parties. <laughs> she feels like it would be better if there were more field trips that students are actually interested in, like maybe hosting a watch party at a movie theater for movies that students actually want to see. Maybe upper class trips to different states or cities, like the DC trip for eighth graders. But high school students could go to New York City or visit the Statue of Liberty or Chicago. Chicago has a lot of interesting museums. The underclassmen would have this to look forward to, and it could be an incentive for good behavior. The majority of Akron Public School students do the right thing, but the focus is always on the select bunch that chooses the wrong behavior. Abby would like to advocate for more acknowledgement of students who are doing the right thing. For example, more celebrations for students who are doing the right thing, like an elementary style field day with different stations designed for high school students. Students should help design the day and have a choice of what stations they attend during the day. On behalf of the student board, we are willing to meet with adults to develop a list of student-friendly incentives that would encourage students to come to school and actively engage in positive school behaviors and activities. Thank you. Thank you. So I would love to get a copy of those remarks. Um, so, so, so we, because again, I was so mesmerized, I was not taking notes, I was listening to you. And so I uh, read the words of Ms. Current. And so there are a lot of really good ideas that were baked in there. So I would love to make sure that before we exit this evening that, that we find someone to get a copy of those remarks. So um, thanks, thanks again, I appreciate you. Um, so next, we are going to pivot um, to recognitions. Um, this is item 2.1. Uh, OSBA School Board Recognition Month, and I will pivot to you, Madam Superintendent. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to actually go to the sideboard. We're going to embarrass you all just for a few <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and for our board members and for members who were able to be here in person, we do hope that as you walked in, uh, you were warmly greeted by our students who were able, their likenesses were able to join us because there was a personalized shout out for each of you. Uh, because uh, January is a special month uh, for board members across the state of Ohio, uh, as it is the month that we recognize the important role that board members play in schools and in communities. 
Um, it's especially uh, special uh, in Akron uh, because just as a reminder that right here in Akron, the construct of school boards actually began. The Akron law, which was established a which established a publicly funded school system with a board and a superintendent, was created in 1847, right here in Akron, Ohio. In 2022, 175 years had passed where serving students in Akron through good times and challenging times was what boards did. We were growing uh, over that span of time and sometimes shrinking um, as the population ebbed and flowed through the 19th, 20th, and now the 21st century. From a time in the 19th century when the Board of Education added manual training classes for boys and domestic science actually was of course added for girls to learn how to be wives and mothers um, to today when boys and girls study such things as robotics, artificial intelligences, are also able to express their creative arts and participate in many different types of sports Akron, um, through its board guidance, has made sure that its students have had really steady experiences. Um, all until today, uh, the board uh, continues to help guide its students, and today our district is made up of a student body that speaks uh, more than 50 languages, which is very different from the 19th century when um, the board in the district at that time struggled to support immigrant children. The board has also uh, managed over the years um, its footprint. And so just as an example, in a short period of time, the board guided the building of Henry, Howe, some of these buildings might sound familiar, Allen, Leggett, Grace, Bryan School, Miller, Fraunfelter, Finley and Portage Path, all in almost just a 20 year period of time. And so um, really managing that footprint has been a, a part of what has always been done. Our school board is one of 700 such boards across the state. School board members are elected members of communities they serve. They give voice to help shape a successful tomorrow for scholars, supporting staff, and um, in the community at large. To show our appreciation uh, today, uh, we asked some of our amazing and talented artists um, under the direction of their teachers at Firestone, Jennings, Miller South, uh, to create uh, their board portraits of each of you. So each one of them took on a board member and um, created a portrait for you, a keepsake. You will see that these works of art that are in front of you are, are amazing. Uh, each art teacher and artist uh, selected the materials to use in the portrait from charcoal pencil to watercolor to acrylic paints to colored pencils and colored chalk. So each one chose a different medium, and each scholar chose the style of their um, portrait to create. I think you'll agree when we say that not only did they do a great job, they also really used their creativity, which they were encouraged to do. So some, uh, we had some other examples where they were superheroes or uh, some of them had color contrast, things of that nature. But on the back of your portrait, you can see the school that did it. And I know, Mr. Alexander, you already asked that you want the scholar's name because you want the scholar to sign off. We'll be sure to have that um, done. But we, we thank our current board and really all boards of education for doing the hard work necessary to support high quality teaching and learning through a lens of equity. Uh, to ensure that future students, future scholars that graduate from our schools are well-rounded, thoughtful, bright leaders and citizens of tomorrow that in essence they will be prepared to play it back and to make sure that their APS experience uh, counts greatly. So thank you to our board members. For those of you who are assembled, if you join me in applauding our board members on their appreciation.
Well, I feel like I should say something here. Um, so as I walked around the table, uh, I, I had a chance to look at the other portraits before I looked at my own. And, um, and I was amazed at um, the talent that is, that is on display. Um, and then I came around, I looked at my own, and I realized that um, this is a much more handsome version of me. Um, so I have to make sure I thank the, the author, but, but I'm sorry, the artist. But I, I, I would love if we, could, if we could just get a list of the artists for each, because I'd like to know who the artists were for all of them. Um, you know. Working on that when she yeah. earlier, she came to me and said uh, that she was going to get all the names and make sure we got them. So she took pictures. So. Okay, roger that. Roger that. It, and, you know, and so I know mine is from Jennings. And when I looked at mine in particular, um, I, I had assumed that these were like high school juniors and seniors in, in the arts. And this has to be someone who's in junior high because it says Jennings. I apologize. I, I can't read the student's name on here, but uh, but again, want to make sure I get it so I can send them a personal note. Um, and would love to send all of these artists a, a personal note, and would love to meet them too. Maybe at a follow-up board meeting, it'd be great. It'd be great if we could have them come in, and we could take pictures with the artists and us in our portrait. I think that would be a really nice touch. Um, you know, um, so Miss Ryman, I, I will I will prevail upon you to to, to please remind me to, to ask about this again. Um, so. Uh, but you know, but so again, these these were these were lovely and um, so appreciated. So um, I don't know if anybody else has any reflections on this. Yes, Ms. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Superintendent, I would just like to thank you and your whole um, team for your thoughtfulness um, time and time again um, for board appreciation and the things that you do for us. Um, it was a pleasant surprise to walk through the doors and to see how everything was uh, laid out. It was like, wait a minute. Hi, Ms. Jackson. Hi, Ms. Archie. And I'm like, hi <laughs> to the cardboard fixtures, right? <laughs> but um, it's just, this is what it's all about because for me personally, that's why I became a school member board member because it was about the children. It was about the youth because I completely understand that what comes out of our schools directly impacts the city that I live in, that I've grown up in. So it's just, it's just very um, delightful and heartwarming, not just to be appreciated, but to see the talent in who we are serving. We are serving the next new innovator, artist, entrepreneur, you know, all these talents are within our school and this is what it's about. Out. So our, although they are appreciating us, I want to appreciate you all because the vision is so great and the, the greatest part of the vision is that we serve children that are capable to do this. And as Dr. Hall said, mine's as a middle school student. Majority of all of these, I think it was two Firestone artists, um, were middle school students. You know, so I'm just, it makes me all the more passionate and excited to do the work to help properly prepare propel them into who God is calling them to be, into their destinies, to make sure that the environments are suitable, that teachers are teaching in a spirit of excellence, and that we are uplifting that spirit by supporting those teachers that support our children. So thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, all central office staff, for all that you do, teachers, and everyone else. I think that's well said, Ms. Jackson. Are there other, other thoughts? Anybody else? OK. All right, next we will pivot to um, item 3.1, school improvement process. Madam Superintendent. Yes, um, we have tried to uh, make sure that um, during each of the board meetings we are able to share a snippet of um, how we're operating the district, so what, how things work, um, and then also or highlighting programs. So tonight, we're really pleased to ask uh, Mr. Keith uh, Lichty uh, to come to uh, Clifford to our side um, panel, and he's going to talk about our school improvement process. So this is a lot about how it is we monitor and support our buildings to remain focused on producing results and providing excellence for our scholars. Keith? All right. Uh, thank you, Superintendent fowler Mack, and the board for giving us this opportunity today. Um, so just a short presentation and then some time for Q&A if, if you have some questions. But I wanted to start with our theory of action uh, and talk about how we feel we're connected uh, in the Office of School Improvement. So through, through our work, we are about looking at the data, providing feedback, and using that to drive excellence in our schools. Uh, and through our work, we're working across departments uh, to foster that collaboration here within the schools and uh, its central office. 
Uh, and when we think about the board's advanced three and three plan, we are connected to that academic achievement through that OIP process, the Ohio Improvement Process, and that's what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. Uh, equity, we touch on equity, again, through that Ohio Improvement Process, uh, specifically PLCs, where we talk about uh, the learning and the outcomes of every child. Uh, so with that, uh, our learning intentions today are one, to understand the role of the Office of School Improvement, to review what the Ohio Improvement Process is, uh, and understand the functions of PLCs, Professional Learning Communities, SIP, our School Improvement Planning Teams, and PACE. And believe it or not, there's no acronym for PACE. It's just <laughs> keeping pace. Uh, so we do follow uh, improvement science. The state of Ohio has adopted the Ohio Improvement Process as their model. And so as I talk about the different levels of leadership, uh, know that this is the cycle of improvement that we're following. So identifying, uh, identifying the, the problems, the issues that we're trying to tackle, uh, researching that, looking at the data, developing the plan, monitoring the plan, uh, and then examine and reflect is a part of uh, all of those. And so these are the three big areas that I'm gonna dive in today. Uh, and so starting at the bottom, uh, PLCs or professional learning communities, uh, that's our teacher's role uh, where they're looking at data, identifying research-based strategies to improve instruction. The SIP team is the building leadership, the administrators and the teachers working together uh, in support of that work. And then PACE is that central office. So bringing together the folks here at 10 North Main uh, and helping to lead that work. And all of these themselves are a cycle, so we really strive for two-way communication between all of those groups. So the SIP team knowing what the PLCs are doing, PACE team knowing what the SIP teams are doing, and providing that feedback so everybody can grow in their practices. Uh, so I'm gonna go a little bit deeper for each of those areas, and so that first one is professional learning communities. And we have been doing this work for a lot of time, I think for about eight years. Uh, but in the past two years, we've tried to reboot that. Uh, so getting feedback from our educators, uh, we discovered that many of them did not like professional learning communities or see that value. Uh, and even ODE themselves will tell you it's a little bit compliance driven. A lot of boxes to check, a lot of bullet points, and, and uh, teachers were so focused on getting all of that right for their administrator that they weren't having the good, rich conversations. Uh, so we worked with ODE and we worked uh, alongside AEA um, to modify that form a little bit and really uh, try to encourage the conversations. And so uh, I know you've seen the word Corwin uh, flow past your desks. And so we did tap them a couple of years ago to um, share with us the PLC plus model of PLCs and that plus being all about professional learning and how we're growing as educators. Uh, so you see on the screen, those are the five questions that teachers answer during their PLC process. Uh, and just to break that down a little bit more, that uh, where are we going, that's teachers really identifying those Ohio State standards and what is it that every student needs to learn. The where are we now, that's digging into the data, whether it's classroom assessments, OSTs, uh, iReady data, knowing where every student is so we have a starting place. The how we move learning forward, that's the plus piece, um, where teachers are coming together, they're identifying the research-based strategies that way they wanna try to employ in their classrooms and they're learning from one another, uh, whether it's doing classroom walks, reading an article, watching a YouTube video. But we wanna make sure when everybody leaves that PLC, they know exactly how they're gonna implement that strategy. Uh, that what did we learn today? That's that moment of reflection. Uh, so coming back together, uh, we talk a lot about formative assessments. So that's the test in between tests or quizzes, like how do we know the kids are getting it? So they bring those to the meeting, they talk about those, and they make modifications. So maybe some students aren't getting it or we're missing groups of students. Um, so they go back and plan. And then lastly, that who benefited and who did not. Um, so that's really kind of looking at that end result. Where are we at? Um, we get our school designations, uh, a lot of, uh, of what we 
uh, are held accountable to are our subgroups. And so we ask the teachers, look at your subgroups. Are your white students making as much progress as your black students? And if not, what are we going to do about it? What are those things that we need to go back and think about as a team and reflect on our own teaching? Uh, so our professional learning communities, again, it was about teacher voice, so giving them, uh, making them authentic and about what they wanted uh, to talk about, so they do create those agendas. Uh, it's really important what we tell our teachers, if you didn't walk away from your PLC with learning something, then it probably was a waste of time. So again, we want them to buy in, and so that's why we ask them to be the activator or the facilitator. They're the ones asking the hard questions. They're the ones pushing each other to dig deeper in their thinking. Um, and then again, researcher, note taker, things that you might be familiar with. Uh, we're trying to, uh, in this reboot, push past those operating norms, like come to the meeting on time, uh, have everybody speak, and, and really think about how we're pushing each other in our work and our thinking. Uh, and, and giving space for all voices. And then again, this is all based on improvement science. Uh, so there are also four cross-cutting values, which is another reason why we adopted uh, Corwin. So through that work, um, through the PLCs, we're all going to be on the same page, and that's building individual and collective efficacy. And we know that there's a lot of research behind moving students when we have collective efficacy. High expectations for all kids as a byproduct. <clears throat> Equity, because we're looking at all learners as a byproduct. And again, um, that activation, getting teachers involved and having those hard discussions with themselves. Uh, so that's, that's the ground level. That's the work that's happening with our teachers. Uh, that next level is our school improvement teams. And so this is educators and administrators, and we like to have representation from every grade level or subject area in secondary. Uh, and intervention specialists and coaches all are part of that voice. But this team is responsible for the rollout of their goals and initiatives. So of course we expect folks to uh, uh, roll out you know, the, the reading adoption, the math adoption, there are district initiatives, but there's other things that our school improvement teams uh, take on as a team to say, you know, we're gonna roll out the adoption better if we do this. And so that's their work. And we have a three-year plan we file with the state, uh, and we monitor that here. Uh, we focus on four areas. The state has eight buckets. We focus on four, academics, climate, family, community engagement, and graduation. And so that's, uh, that's the data we collect, the action steps we create, and, and we monitor. Uh, they're also charged with aligning their resources. So Title I uh, is a big budget. We're about $18 million of federal funds to support uh, supplemental education. And so the teams do some site-based management there. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, they roll out those initiatives. Our SIP teams meet uh, one to two times a month. If they're a focus school or a priority school, um, they're meeting twice a month. And so that um, that's an investment of our teachers. That shows. Um, true leadership. They're giving up some time after school to come together and tackle uh, the needs of their building and, and to be leaders of their grade level. Uh, additionally to those monthly meetings, we pull our SIP teams together during the summer, uh, fall, we're getting ready uh, in a couple weeks to do winter SIP, and then SIP closeout is our end of the year activity. Uh, and then of course instructional improvement days is another opportunity for the teams to get together to dig into their data uh, and monitor their action steps. Uh, so as I mentioned, that some of the things that they do is manage their budgets. Uh, through this whole process, know that we are, uh, we are rich in data. We are looking at the state standards. We are looking at the state assessments. We are looking at our district assessments to identify uh, the needs that guides our work. Uh, and then SIP teams are asked to you know, put the money next to the strategy. So uh, what are those contracts that we need? What are those supplemental teachers that we need? What grade levels? And so they're putting their money in things like staffing, professional development, and supplies to support the work. And so that third group is PACE, one of my favorites. Uh, so this is our district leadership team. It's mostly, it's made up of 10 North Main. And, 
And we use data to drive our decision making and, and to help push learning and the work forward in the district. Um, it is about accountability and support is what we say. 50% accountability, 50% support. And so with that, we do have a robust team. Uh, you can see on the screen, we have our principal supervisors. They're our leads and they play a big role in that accountability uh, because they're sitting there with their principals. Uh, and then we have members from the other offices, school improvement, teachers and learn, teach and learning, special ed, uh, CCAA, and then we do have some state support team eight. And these are the resource folks. So they, the, the people on these team bring expertise and value from all of their departments, uh, and they enrich the conversations around data, uh, helping to monitor their action steps, lending their knowledge, and then, of course, at the end of every PACE meeting, we give an opportunity for the principal to say, and I need your help, and I need your help, and I need you to come on Tuesday, uh, and they provide that support. Uh, so when we go out, this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we look at. We're looking for that cycle of improvement. We're looking at the building uh, is doing work around evidence-based strategies. We look at their three-year plans, uh, especially around the instructional components, community, climate, and graduation, as I mentioned before. We also make sure they're aligned to the district goals. Uh, so we work with the different departments. We make sure that we're, uh, we're aligned with the goals that have been set forth by our leadership team. Uh, and then we also monitor the professional learning community. So we take a look at the minutes and make sure, again, that the teams are on the right track. Uh, and if not, we can send out support uh, from any of the departments. Uh, PACE is broke down a little bit more. We, uh, we do pre-PACE where we come together, all the team members, and we look at the data together and we make our game plan together. So again, all departments um, talking about the plan and what we need as we go out. Uh, then we have PACE week. Today was the last day of PACE week. So those are one hour meetings with the team, again, looking at the plans, support and accountability. Uh, and then next week we'll have post-PACE. Uh, and that's where we give an opportunity for the leadership team that's not out in the building to come together and we synthesize what we heard. Um, so what were the trends and the needs across the different buildings? Uh, and then we can respond and plan together uh, and, and tackle the short-term and long-term uh, goals. So those are the three big, those are the three big movements of our school improvement process. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an example, so I chose Voris. I know, uh, I know a lot of contracts, for example, have come through Voris. They have led the work uh, through Corwin and Teacher Clarity. So I thought I'd give you a little sneak of their plan. Uh, so they receive $187,000 out of Title I federal dollars. And remember, um, because it's federal dollars, because it's Title I, it's all supplemental. So after, after we apply all the teachers by whatever ratio um, the board has put forth, we then can put those supplemental things on top. Uh, so for Voris, that's through an instructional coach supporting our teachers and our learners. Uh, it's tutors, so they had four tutors that they budgeted for. Uh, and then family liaisons, that's been an investment from our office for a while, and supplies. Uh, now, this is where you're seeing a lot of those contracts come through. Our schools that have a school improvement status of uh, focus or priority, they receive additional funds to help close the gaps. So in Voris's case, they get $63,000, and that money, at the time when we wrote the grant was geared just for professional development. We can't hire new staff with that. We can't even do after school programming or summer school. It had to be on developing staff. And so the SIP team, the teachers and administrators in that building uh, three and a half years ago chose to focus on teacher clarity. Um, so half of that goes towards that contract and then the other half goes for extended time for the teachers, uh, we do value their work, and they put a lot of work in after school, and so we will pay them a stipend so they can get together and collaborate and do that work. Uh, here's just a little snippet of their three-year plan. So in alignment with our district goal of increasing eight points in our performance index, uh, they're working to get that performance index to 81. 
uh, that will be their eight points. And then how are they going to do that? Their goal is to decrease the number of students in the intensive tier by 50%. So if they can get those kids out of the intensive tier up to readers on grade level, uh, we're gonna hit that eight points. They're gonna do that through their adult implementation measures. So I listed a few of them there. Uh, so again, with their strategy being uh, teacher clarity, that's a big focus on learning intentions. You see that LI up there and success criteria. So learning intentions means the teachers being very clear about what it is that they expect students to know and learn and do. And that success criteria is the students and the teachers understanding what that looks like. So what does it look like when we get it right? And they're moving, you've seen that Corwin contract come back a few times because now they're moving into their third phase, which is assessment capable learners. That means that the students, kindergarten, first, second, they can look at a piece of work and know what success looks like. That kindergartner can tell you, if I do A, B, and C, I will have mastered that content. content. Uh, and they're also working towards being able to give that feedback to their colleagues. So imagine a little kindergartner uh, telling their friend, well, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to get it right. Uh, so it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and so if we have these large investments like Corwin, we want to make sure that people are doing the work that they set out to do. Uh, so in this example, uh, I should probably have mentioned, when we go to PACE, we're always looking at the evidence and analysis. What are you doing? Is it working? And so for them, uh, this is just a sample of their uh, walkthrough form that they're using. So there's five things around teacher clarity that they look for, and they rate every classroom, and this is just for administration, like we don't share everybody else's results, but they bring, they, they uh, aggregate that all together, bring it back, and they might say to the SIP team, well, 60% of our teachers are doing learning intentions and success criteria. What are we going to do about those teachers that aren't quite there yet? And that team begins to build that support. What does that look like? More professional development, send the coach in, uh, mentoring from somebody you know down here. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, with that, is it working? So I pulled some current data, uh, and I would have to say, yes, it is working at Voris. Uh, so remember, they're trying to decrease that intensive tier by 50%. We're halfway through the year, and you can see in reading, um, they have increased the number of students on level. Uh, so that means they're no longer intensive and targeted by 21%. So we would want to see, you know, 25% if, if they were uh, halfway through the year. Um, so now only 5% of the students at Voris uh, are two or more grade levels below. This is kind of this is the kind of work that's going to uh, get them out of their designation. Math isn't uh, quite as good. Um, so they have increased 17% of their students who are on level, so a little bit more to go to reach halfway. Uh, we know the beginning of the year was very challenging, so we, uh, we expect to see some great gains in this second half of the year for that team. Uh, so that was our district measure. Uh, our local measure for Voris is phenomenal. Um, so they received four out of five stars in their gap closing, so that's uh, the improvement that we're seeing in our subgroups. Uh, so they have exceeded state standards. Wouldn't we all like to exceed state standards? Uh, in progress, that's that value added uh, if we're keeping our place in line. And they got the highest possible, uh, which means significant evidence that they're exceeding student growth expectations. That means they're leading the growth within the state, because that's a comparison between uh, their building and the rest of the state. And then achievement. Not as good, two stars, but we know that if we're doing the work around closing the gap and we're doing the work around progress, the next thing we're going to hit is achievement. So that is big picture, uh, some of what the school improvement uh, office does. Uh, if, there, if there's time for questions, I can field any questions. I think we have time for questions, Mr. Clifford. Um, so. 
do have questions. Ms. Jackson. Um, what is me um, what is measured? How are we measuring achievement? Because if I'm looking, if you can go back to that slide. So if um, we're seeing an increase here, like for reading fall, the iReady test, like a 20% increase in students who are on level, yeah. then that is some type of academic gains. Is that correct? Yes, and I, I kept it really high level, so we have some great reports that we could probably share with the board. We're using iReady, so these in particular were our fall baseline to our winter baseline mm -hmm. scores. Uh, and as a, as a team, and SIP teams and PACE teams, like we're looking at the student level, the grade level, the building level as we measure, measure those. Yeah, I just, for the community, because I want people mm -hmm. to understand, because growth is growth. Right. So when we say, because some can look at that number and it can seem discouraging in math, even though we know like nationally it's a challenge area yeah. for us. However, significant gains are still being made based off of this. So when we look at the low achievement, I'm just trying to determine by achievement, is that um, what we're talking about, accelerated, proficient, level-wise in all, like what is determining achievement? Uh, Do we have I might need help from my <laughs> I ready people, uh, but essentially, Dr. Caver, you can just go to the yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dr. <laughs> Caver. <laughs> Because you know how a child cannot be at level when they enter right. into the, the first grade classroom, but they may get some gains, which we see growth. And so that's significant and to me. Correct. Thank you. So you are, you are actually answering your own question, but thank you for bringing it out to the community. So the first bullet that said 21% um, increase in students who are on level. So for that one in particular, um, for reading and for math, we are using iReady and we're saying that they're actually on grade level where they should be. And so just from fall to winter, we've had an increase in 17% let's say, in that school overall of students that are have increased to being on level to where they should be in the area of math. So while our achievement <clears throat> scores may be a certain level, um, we are actually measuring growth here as well because we do know that in some many cases our students are starting further behind. Yes, perfect. That's what I want the community to understand. And then, but when we're saying achievement, mm -hmm. what what would need to be established for achievement? That's what I want to like um, unpack that when it says need further assistance to meet achievement. What does that mean? And what it, do you? Does, am I making sense? Oh, yeah, uh, I want to know which slide to the you're local referencing. Report card slide. Right. So this goes back to the report card yes. slide. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so that really would be proficiency on the state okay, assessment. That's what I'm asking. So we're for I ready we're saying okay we have these gains but based off of state standards what is as um, proficient accelerated advanced work still needs to be done for that standard. Correct. That's the achievement for and the state testing. I'm sorry, yes, that's correct. And that's why um, when he's referencing the last bullet there that says the achievement, he made the comment that we're two stars and that is below where we would like to be. Um, having three stars is where you're across the state pretty much saying that you are proficient and where you need to be um, academically. So while we, he used words to show that there's growth and we're making academic gains, but meeting the state standard of being proficient across mm -hmm. the board for where they need to be as a school, we're not there yet. But yes. we are making growth and gains. Wonderful. And that's what the that's all I want the community yes. to see. <laughs> because right. when we see the snapshot, you know, state test is just a quick snapshot. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give the overall picture. So people say, Oh, Akron schools are failing there or whatever is happening. But growth is happening and we're working towards meeting the state, meeting or exceeding the state standards. So thank you, Dr. Caver. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Alexander? Yeah, and, and this is one of the things I, I want to just kind of touch on. Uh, when we look at a report card, report card in any type of manner just gives you letters or whatever it may be, but it doesn't show growth in how a kid is actually doing. And in the past, we had a report card that had where you can show where these kids were making progress, even if they didn't make it a C level, they may have been at a D, but they're now at a D plus and they're almost close to being a C, or they're at a B level and they're almost close to being an A. That's, that's, that's education. Yeah. But I think what happens is they get involved with these 
these letters, and we so concentrate on these letters, we forget about the kids and the growth that they're making. And so the growth is what is more, more important than that, that letter. And so that's the most important piece. So everybody has to, needs to know that that letter is just a letter, but how are they making growth and how much growth have they been making? So if they made more growth from last year to this year and maybe even went higher than that, that's very important. That's the most important. That means they're learning and not that letter grade is not the, the big piece. So I just wanted to put that out there because that was one of the things that I liked about the past report card that allowed you to show that they got away from it. Now it seems like they're trying to come back, which it probably should have never changed because that old report card gave, not old report card, I mean, I mean way back in like <laughs> almost eight, 18 years ago when it was really showing what the kids' progress was. I'm Th sorry, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. And just you know to link it back here, the uh, whole process of monitoring, supporting, um, working with um, you know our educators, both the principal and teachers at the building level to select additional materials and strategies. That's what this whole process is about. So it's about ensuring um, that ongoing growth by making sure that the system is focused in ways that it can continue to support the work that's happening in, in buildings and ultimately in classrooms. Thank you. Thank you for your... Uh, oh, I don't think we're done yet. Um, are there any other additional questions? Okay, I will ask mine. Um, so, and we can start on the, the slide that has the numbers on it, the percentages that you just showed, Mr. Mr. Is it... Mr. Lichty, Mr. Clifford, I want to make sure I'm addressing you appropriately. Uh, my husband likes it when I go by Lichty Clifford. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. I will say Mr. Lichty Clifford, um, henceforth. Um, so on the, so I'll start with the, the top, the reading part. So make sure that, that I understand the numbers component of it. So we're saying that there's a 21% increase in students who are on level. I see the 15 and five. Um, I, so ideally, those numbers would sum to 21. Uh, well, see, I chose, and now, so I'm, you know, I'm second guessing myself now. Yeah. I tried to keep a high level and just gave you some of those percent increases. So we do have like solid numbers behind there um, that would add up to 100 if I would have shown you. So we have, let me say this another way, we have more than 21% of our kids at Voris on grade level, but we increased that number by 21%. No, so I right. don't want to diminish the great work that they're doing over no, there. No, 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 no. I, I, I think I understand that part. Um, but I'm just simply saying that we're saying th that there's a 21% increase in students who are on level, and then we say that there's a 15% decrease in who, uh, who are one level below. Those kids are a part of that 21%. Yes. Right, okay. And, the second, and then the third bullet point, there's a 5% decrease in students who are two or more levels below. That f Those kids are also included in, in the 21%. Yeah, they're either flowing one Is level that, up or two uh, levels they, up. They no? can, they yeah, can I mean, be in either one of those two that are above. Right. So okay. remember, it says two levels below. So that 5% could have moved up to one level, or they yep. could move to one level below. Right. So, that, so that's why I'm asking about the 21% number. I, mm -hmm. How is that 21% if, if all the kids who were two levels or below did not move to on mm -hmm. level? So I'm, ask, I'm asking a math question, right? So, mm -hmm. again, so, so again, recognizing your point, do you understand the, 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 the question I'm asking? I, I do, but I, I think, and just correct, correct me if I'm wrong, that with the broader data set, um, these are um, just a snapshot of the different ways you can look at the broader data set. It's not necessarily that it's all a subset, that this snapshot is just a subset. Yeah, I think I understand yeah. what you're saying. So but when you think yeah. about the hundred percent. Yeah. So, yeah. but that's why I'm asking my question, Mr. Sure. Lickie Clifford, because, again, if what we're saying here is that, is that there's a 21 percent increase in students who are on level, right? Mm -hmm. and there's a 15 percent decrease in students who are one level below. Those students are now on level. Is that what we're saying? Yes. Okay. So, and then we're saying that there's a 5% decrease in students who are two levels or more below. And Dr. Caver, you said that not all those students went from two levels below to on level, right? So some of them would, would have only gone from two levels below to one level below. All I'm saying is that, is, is that the math doesn't seem to, to make sense. And so that's why I'm asking for clarity around that. So if we don't have it here today, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But again, the public watches these meetings. 
And so we're presenting numbers. I want the numbers to, to make sense to the folks who are watching at home, and, and, and it doesn't make sense to me, right? So and I'll ask a similar question with regard to math fall to winter iReady, right? So, so there's a 70% increase in students who are on level. There's a 4% decrease in who are one level below, right? And there's a 23% decrease, right? So in that scenario, the 17 could, could make sense because to your point, Dr. Caver, not every student would have jumped to on level. Mm -hmm. so, so that scenario, that makes sense to me. I follow that. But the top one does not. So that's why I'm asking the question. So, and I don't need an answer today. I'm just simply saying that that's, you know, the numbers have to make sense, right? Um, so that's my first question slash comment. My, my second um, question was going to be around um, the... Um, the Title I allocation. So uh, I think I know the answer, but I, I just want to make sure I understand. Um, the principals of the buildings have singular control over how they spend their Title I funds, or, is there, or are, are there more? They may consult with folks in the building, but I'm saying, but ultimately, they're the, they're, they're the principal accountable party for determining how Title I funds get spent in their school. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. Yes, we, we talk a lot about bumpers. So we do yep. have some parameters that they need to stay within, and we work collaboratively uh, with the other departments. So we're not going to let somebody bring in a reading program that takes from the core. And so th there's some checks and balances there, but essentially uh, they do make a lot of those decisions. Okay, gotcha. Um, and then the other question I had, you, this is back on the, uh, the pay slide. Um, so, you thought you, so you mentioned the folks who are, who are part of that committee. I guess what I don't have under, a, a good understanding of is um, what resources do they have access to to effectuate change in a building, right? So, so, they, so insofar as that they are identifying a problem or an issue that's resource-based, um, you know, how are they empowered to get to, to direct more resources to a given building to address a given problem or issue? Because I, I guess I don't have good clarity around that. Um, and so, so, and again, that, that maybe not a question for you, but, I just, but, but just a question to senior staff or superintendent, like if, if any of you wants to pr talk, yeah. speak to that. And, and I just think it depends uh, okay. on kind of what the um, support is. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, Keith mentioned was the post pace that really then trickles into the senior team uh, meetings and things of that nature where then we have representatives from the entire district who are able to leverage support on behalf of the school. So say for instance, one of the things outside of their uh, learning resources that they might need are some other types of personnel supports, you know, um, to help with the educational climate, things of that nature. Well, those types of requests then go more up the chain, and we have to consider the overall impact of the district, the, the total resources available. Uh, we've been able to be, though, I think extremely creative uh, in that most things that buildings have identified as stated needs, we found a way through our collection of resources to really make sure that support happens. And so, but again, the vehicle for that oftentimes is the post pace or even the school teams meetings uh, with the senior team to raise raise those needs. Great, thank you, Madam Superintendent. I appreciate that. Um, the next question I had was about the iReady component. So how does the how did the iReady assessments correlate to um, the state tests? So if I if I see a ten percent increase in iReady, does that correspond or correlate strongly to a ten percent increase in my state assessment or or my state test score? You know, or 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 are those question banks that are in iReady? Are they generated by a different vendor or company? Because I, I, I asked the question because I'm trying to assess, or we're hoping that, that you can shed light on how valuable is I ready? Mm -hmm. So we are, um, so it's, it's a national. Um, norm test, and it is not produced by the same vendor as okay. our state assessments. Yep. Um, they do go through, um, just like many other vendor assessments, some type of um, national norming to determine with our state, even within state norming as well, um, the predictability on our Ohio state tests. Mm -hmm. So um, I already does have inside of it where it'll tell us, uh, give us um, a prediction as to how our scholars will perform on the assessment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, for us, <clears throat> or I would like to say that in the past, I would always like to go back and determine how, how closely aligned their prediction was with the actual results that we have received. Um, there may be someone from our assessment team that may be able to correlate and give you that information more in terms of how long. I know for the middle school, like we're just starting, it's our first year, um, just trying it out in, in with iReady, so we won't have answers there. But the elementary team has been using it for a couple years now. Um, I won't give the exact amount, but I think it's been closely um, aligned to my knowledge as a great predictor for us. Uh -huh in the elementary building, so that would be for us in grades three through five, and um, we've also been using it in the East Cluster um, with those sixth graders for a little while as well. So but, I just, can I just amplify the, mm -hmm. the notion of um, a predictive assessment versus a diagnostic? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's um, giving uh, us our best point of view with good instruction, so with you know, continuity, so it is dependent upon those things happening, but as uh, Dr. Caver said, we've been um, pretty spot on in terms of it being able to tell a story about what we should anticipate. Yeah, because I, I, I would love to see information presented that talks about the, the predictive abilities, right? So if it predicted at 75% pass rate, was it 50%? Or was it 90 percent, mm -hmm. right? So because because I know as I as I tour schools, I hear I ready all the time, <laughs> right? So I mean all the time because they're always doing I ready, I ready, I ready, I ready, I ready, I ready, right? So to me, I'm just I, I ask the question because I know that when we look at our our district report card score, there's opportunities to be to be better, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm at so I guess I'm trying to get at you know is that tool a tool that we that we believe is a tool that's going to help contribute to us improving. The certain aspects of that of that rating that it should be contributing to increases in success in right. So, and if it's not, is, is there is there a competitor to iReady that maybe we can look at that perhaps would be better? That's the question I'm asking, right? Because again, I'm assuming that we spend. I haven't looked at the numbers yet, but I know that we probably spent a fair amount of money on on, on iReady, right? So, so just from a community perspective. If we're spending money on that kind of program, mm -hmm. I think I think we, you know, it'd be great to elucidate right. the degree to which it's helping us get to where we want to get to from a from a performance improvement standpoint. So absolutely, yeah. and so um, just to answer your not completely answer your yeah, question, yeah, yeah. but just yeah. to give you a little bit of information, like the superintendent said, so some of it is predictability. Yeah. Um, it also has been interrupted, you know, with yeah. COVID mm -hmm. and things like that. So the last couple of years comparing exactly the outcomes that we are getting, we know that there are other factors that have interrupted our learning yeah. as well. So it's been, this year will be a, a better year for us to um, judge and evaluate that as well. I just wanna make sure I, I declare that. Um, also, in terms of what, is it getting us the outcome that we want? Um, I know the district has looked at competitors in the past. And so, um, again, we just want to give it the opportunity with a, what I would call a normal school year mm -hmm. to see what the outcomes are, um, the prediction. And then lastly, I just want to set and how the prediction is aligned to what we actually um, achieve. Mm -hmm. And then the last part I want to say is that we also want to recognize already as a supplement. So it's not a program that we're that we can implement that's going to give us all of what uh, we expect to get out of our classrooms from core instruction from our great teachers. Mm -hmm. And so it is a supplemental program to assist with, um, and we try to stress that to to assist with intervention as well as some acceleration, mm -hmm. and and um, to assist our scholars. Gotcha. No, I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. to your point. Programs like iReady, just like Alex, how we use Alex for math and the system. Um, it not only, they're good, we want to be careful when we talk. I love what you said, Dr. Hall, about um, analyzing it for its impact, right? Yeah. But just like with education, it seems like something new comes out and we want to switch, we want to switch before we really have gotten mastery and the teachers are comfortable with giving the students these type of assessments. And things like Alex and iReady, they, they've perform a, a certain diagno diagnostic measure because it lets you know where that child is performing in areas that they need improvement in, which to uh, Dr. Caver's point, helps to serve as a supplement for the teacher to be able to inform parents that may want to work with students, the tutors, and also for the teacher themselves to know certain specific students, areas, and group the students even 
because some may be um, performing at a higher rate. So that's what these programs, I love to see iReady when I go into buildings and teachers using, especially those teachers who are on those great schedules and the students get an expectation to know, okay, we're doing iReady. And if they're really looking at what the data is telling them, then it better equips them um, to serve our students. But when we go into another system, that's another training for teachers to get familiar with the system. And then you have to go through the, all of that learning curve and now we starting all over. So I think it's gonna be great as Dr. Caver said, to really be able to have a full school year and to analyze over a, you know, a couple years whatever growth and gains that we can see. So I was glad that you brought up that point yeah. because it will be good to inform broadly the community yeah. as well as ourselves, but these are really good programs. And when we talk about national norms, we know that at third grade, students should have a level of mastery in this content area, right? And so that's what uh, most of these are based on. Yeah, I think part, so thank you for that, Mr. Jackson. I, I think part of it is just really connecting the dots, right? I mean, so so again, you know, how are we measuring the success of I ready in our schools? Is it just an increase in the state assessment? Are there other are there other KPIs that you're using to assess, yeah. you know, or to evaluate its overall effect, right? Mm -hmm. And and so so that's so that's really the thrust of the question I'm asking, right? And, and mm -hmm. not asking for an answer right mm -hmm. now in this moment, right? But again, but 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 that's so. First off, this was a great intro presentation, right, to establish a framework and, to, you know, and to give the board an idea about, about the vocabulary and what is PACE, what is SIP, things like that. So I think it's very encouraging, very educational. That's, so I think the next question is, yes? Really quick, just um, to add on to that. I do you want to go to the mic so, so folks can hear you? <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, hold no, you're good. Um, iReady is one of the state approved ass assessments for an alternative for grade three. Yeah. And so that's really helpful for us, but also that individual pathway that Dr. Caver's talking about in addition to the instruction. So it does align with that third grade guarantee yeah. um, promotional criteria, which is nice. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I was also going to just um, add that as we continue to evaluate this notion of what's working, um, the instruction, things of that nature, is one aspect of it. We, we do have other supports that we're pleased here in Akron are in place to support students. So one of the things that we took advantage of with our ESSER funds that is highly promoted uh, at the federal and state level is this notion of high dosage tutoring. So um, to make sure that, again, uh, for students whose learning was interrupted, that they can have more repetition and better supports. Uh, we, we have a robust uh, high dosage tutoring program as well. So along with watching uh, growth in the broad sense, we're watching growth as it relates to smaller groups of children. So with certain types of performance. So again, we talked about those students who are a few levels below. And so we're watching them as well for the impact of these other supports um, to make sure that they are, are growing. So uh, learning is complex. It's uh, also uh, a beautiful art. Um, and we're fortunate to have uh, an array of supports and programs and practices. And it's why all of those levels of collaboration and communication continue to be so vital. And if I may add to, I'm sorry, you know, this is my sweet spot. But um, also, when we talk about um, our report cards and, and what they reflect, it's very important that we know that we have some students that come into the kindergarten program with parent, that are reading at first grade level, some that didn't read anything and didn't go to a preschool program. So a teacher is getting the gambit, right? And so now they have to become masters of differentiated teaching, right? And so because of that, it, regardless of which assessment you use, you're gonna have report cards that can reflect um, poorly, right? And it's not necessarily because of the tools are not effective within a district, it's just we're working two years behind because you're coming to kindergarten as a five-year-old and if 25, 30% of that class is at a three-year-old level, mm -hmm. like a preschool level, you see the word? Well, I think that's where so, this slide right here that's up is important, right? Because because students may come in at different levels, but the degree to which we can 
work with them to get them on level or to decrease the number of kids who, who, are, who are not on level, I mean, that's, that's where the measurement, I think, becomes really valuable, right? Because to your point, I think, I think we can all accept in the room that, that our students come to us from different pathways, right? Um, you know, and that's why, they, I think to Mr. Alexander's point, the, the growth piece. Now, in the new report card, the achievement category is the one that's supposed to be measuring growth. Am I, so, so, so or actually, let me rephrase that. Where is growth measured in the current report card? The progress component. The progress component, mm -hmm. OK. OK, gotcha, gotcha, OK. And that was on the other yeah. slide. Yeah. It's, it's measured in two areas, gap closing and then also in, but the biggest one is progress. And just I just want to point out, in Boris' case, they got the highest amount of stars, which is mm -hmm. five stars, right. yep. in the area of progress. Mm -hmm. progress. So that's the example that Mr. Um, that Keith was <laughs> trying to trying to um, point out and then also combining that with what we see happening as we're measuring along the way with some of the growth using iReady yep. data. Yeah. So I've got two questions. Left. I'm asking my share and Dr. Akbar's and Ms. McKittrick's share of questions tonight. Um, so my, so my, my, my penultimate question uh, was going to be around um, pace. So how do we evaluate the, the effectiveness of pace? How do we evaluate the effectiveness of pace? Well, I asked because because I looked at the list of folks you have on the team, yeah. and they're all, from my standpoint, those are all district rock stars, right? I mean, so so how do we evaluate how effective that 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 rock band is um, in 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 what they're trying to you know to to do? So one one thing that we do have for every group, whether it's PLC, SIP, or uh, pace. Uh, because again, we're following the Ohio improvement yeah. process, but we call it different things. So mm -hmm. other schools might call it a district focus team or a district mm -hmm. leadership team. Mm -hmm. And there are rubrics in a continuum where we do self-reflect and say, well, you know, here's where we are uh, in our own leadership in those different roles. So that's one way that we would measure our effectiveness. I, I don't know, Dr. Caver, if you want to also talk about post pace uh, as a way to of um, assessing some degree of um, effectiveness with that. And then when I even do the superintendent's uh, report, I'll also speak because we're right at that time of year where we've had some step back to kind of look at our processes. And uh, this past Friday, we had the step back as well. Um, to evaluate the support schools are receiving through our structure of having a schools division with principal supervisors and to really talk through what evidence that we're seeing that that is making a difference. So there, there are built-in ways in which we're trying to evaluate our, our practice through things observed, and then we also take responsibility and accountability for uh, achievement as well. So uh, that whole continuum theory of change, uh, the responsibility for achievement doesn't just rest with teachers, it comes all the way up you know, through the organization that each of us feels responsible and accountable for our students achieving at the building level. But Dr. Caver? I think that you and Keith put it together beautifully. There, there are two ways, um, like he said, there is a rubric that um, we have from, even from the state in terms of evaluating how is your BLC or your um, PLC working, or in, in our case, our DLC or PACE mm -hmm. also, so we can use that rubric to kind of evaluate ourselves and try to make improvements. But ultimately, um, the other measure is just what this what the superintendent just stated. And that is that we want to see the growth, we want to see the achievement, we want to see the things um, at every level all the way through the central office level. So I'll add the post-pace part we had added this year. Um, so we had pre-pace, we came up with a game plan in the past, and then we went out to the buildings and we actually had pace week. And so this year we've added post-pace, and it was now that you've gone out into the land and actually experienced and had those conversations, um, we have communication as a two-way street. So now we come back to post-pace to see what are the things at this level that, have, that you've discovered while you were actually there, boots on the ground, um, that need to be addressed, that we can offer support, that we can implement in our theory of action, so that if we do this, the principals can do that, that, which means that the teachers can do this, and then ultimately that our students achieve. So at the end, the um, ultimate measure is are our schools improving? 
Yeah, and I think yeah. So 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 I think that's well said. Let me let me draw um, a comparison. Uh, that I think I think will illustrate what I'm driving at with the questions I'm asking. Right. So. Um, so in healthcare, we look at readmission rates. So Ms. Autry, I think you know, I think you get this too, right? Um, so patient is discharged from the hospital. We want to see how, what percentage of patients are readmitted in 30 days. The higher, if that, if that number is high, that's that's not good, right? Um, and so what tends to happen is, you know, health systems put in place programs to try to reduce readmissions, right? So they might have a program uh, around medication reconciliation, making sure that patients have the right meds when they go home, right? Because that's important, right? There might be another person that's looking at, well, do patients have a follow-up appointment within seven days of discharge from the hospital, right? Another uh, intervention might be, oh, well, now we have a care management program that's, the, that's addressing things. So the question becomes is, the hard part is now, when I see my readmission rate decrease, how do I know which program had the impact on that, right? Because, because I'm making funding decisions, right, uh, with regard to each of those different pathways I talked about. So when I ask about PACE, for example, and we're at, I'm thinking about, oh, well, we say the ultimate outcome is student success, right? Well, that's great, but there's a lot of things that we think, a lot of programs we have in place that we believe are contributing to that, right? How, how good are we at distinguishing and discerning between the, the disparate programs we have in place and how they impact student outcomes, right? So that's, that's what I'm driving at. Mm -hmm. Not asking for that answer today, but, yeah. but, but, as you're, but as we're thinking about the, the plethora of programs that we have in place, trying to figure out how, how we discern between them all, you know, I think, I think is important because, because they may all be helping, but helping in different ways. So one program may increase, you know, I'm sorry, in my, in my healthcare analogy, one intervention may be decreasing um, the number of patients who go home on the wrong med. Well, I can measure that. And I know that contributes to, you know, to decreasing a readmission rate. So, you know, whereas one might be, you know, well, I saw that there was a 40% increase in patients that made it to the follow appointment on time within seven days. Okay, I, I, but again, I'm measuring that, right? So that's what I'm saying before. I want to understand, like, how do we discern between programs and how they contribute ultimately uh, to student outcomes and success? I mean, that's, that's where I'm driving at with the questions that, that, that I'm trying to get at tonight. So, uh, and then my last question, I promised you that was, I had a penultimate question. My last question, um, so the, the three-year process that you talked about, um, for example, Boris, are all the schools on the same cycle? Are they all on a three-year? So for example, every school in 2019 or 2020 started a new three-year cycle, and then in 2024, everybody starts on a, on a new three-year cycle, or, or is it mixed match across the district? No, it, it is the same cycle. So right okay. now, we are getting ready for our next three-year cycle, yeah. and our winter SIP it's coming this next month, the buildings will be going through a needs assessment mm -hmm. to start identifying what their needs are gonna be. The district team will do the same thing, we'll, we'll do a needs assessment and then begin to build out those three-year plans. Okay. Uh, and then you know, that gets submitted to the state and we, we adjust and revise those plans every semester okay. then as trying to meet our goals. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so the end, So in June of 2023, that's the end of, the, of this current three-year cycle? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic, okay. Um, so looking yeah, forward. Yeah, 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 yeah. As long okay. as we can all stay healthy. Yeah. So, right, so you can't right. tell the true picture because of those years they were missing. Yeah. Right? So yeah. You can take the three years worth of data, you can be able to do what you're asking yeah. mm -hmm. because you can show the tr trend, but the now it's off it's going to be skewed because it's not all things weren't constant. So hopefully, to study. your point though, but hopefully the year three, the, this year, you see a jump, so, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. We, we feel really good that we were able to start um, with, with a set of focus goals and really get the supports that we believed uh, would help it help our buildings improve in place. But as you know, it's a lot of different factors. So trying to measure every aspect of it um, is really challenged at an individualized mm -hmm. level. So one of the things, and we've, we've talked with the board before, um, even through example when we work partnered with John Hopkins uh, to really, one of the things that we believe uh, and we know is true uh, from research is to at least start with the highest quality curriculum possible. Start with evidence-based strategies. Start with, you know, intervention and supports that are able to complement core instruction, not 
take away from, um, but really complement and support good core instruction. So there are some assumptions uh, that first and foremost we want to ensure is there to increase the likelihood then for the, the few things that we are going to monitor. But again, we could drown in all that we could watch uh, because we, we, we are very data rich um, and you can be data rich and information poor just from mere overload. Um, but we do start with those core instruction of starting with the highest quality curriculum, evidence-based practices, and then a point of view about teaching and learning that protects core instruction and then supports. So, okay, I don't have any team. more questions. Does anybody else have any more questions? Ms. Jackson? No, thank you. Oh, I'll roger that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lee Clifford, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. You. Dr. Caber, thank you as well. Okay, you. okay next we'll move to um, the approval of the previous meeting minutes. Um, what is it? Well, we have a quorum. Okay, so moving on to approval of the previous meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the meetings? I'm sorry, I still move the minutes. It's uh, been moved by Mr. Perry. Second. Seconded by Mr. Alexander. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Yes. Mr. Perry? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Next we'll move to item uh, five, five through 16, personal recommendations. Uh, Madam Superintendent. Sure. I wish to recommend approval of the personnel recommendations presented in categories five through 16, please. Is there a motion to approve? I so move to approve. That's been moved by Mr. Perry. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Alexander. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please, Mr. Atkins. Ms. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Ms. Autry? Abstain from 7.2, yes, on the rest. Mr. Perry? Yes. Dr. Hall? I, too, will abstain from 7.2, but yes, on the rest. Okay, motion carries. Uh, next, we'll move to item 17. Is it 17? We're at 17 now? 22. 22, excuse me, 22. 22 right. Uh, next we'll move to the approval of the consent agenda. Surely, and I wish to recommend approval of that uh, resolution and motions presented in category 21. Uh, all of that is in proper format, and I wish uh, to ask for approval, please. Okay, is there a motion to approve? I so move. Okay, it's been moved by Mr. Perry. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Vice President Autry. Any discussion? Yes. Ms. Autry. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge our, our continued donations that we receive from individuals as well as organizations, um, ranging from uh, uniforms, um, gifts for this recent holiday season, um, and then also Project Rise. Um, also wanted to acknowledge the grants uh, embedded within this uh, from the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation, two different grants. Um, one, I believe, is supporting a robotics tournament um, for which we have 50 teams, I believe. Um, and then also um, for College and Career Academy, Academy Middle School Initiatives. And then also the Goodyear uh, Rubber and Tire Company grant, um, which is also going to help our SIM middle and high school. So uh, thank you uh, to those um, organizations uh, for those grants. I think that's well said, Ms. Vice President. Are there any, any other discussion? OK, roll call, please, Mr. Atkins. Mrs. Autry? Yes. Mr. Perry? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. Next, we move to item 23, business affairs recommendations. Madam, Madam Superintendent. Sure, and I wish to recommend approval of the business affairs recommendations in category 23. 
Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, so moved by Ms. Autry, second? Second. Second Seconded by Mr. Alexander. Any discussion? Roll call, please, Mr. Atkins. Mr. Alexander? Yes. Mrs. Autry? Yes. Mr. Perry? Yes. Dr. Hall? Aye. Ms. Jackson? Aye. The motion carries. Next, I believe we proceed to the superintendent's report. Madam Superintendent. Sure, thank you so much. And thank you again for the rich discussion uh, for the school improvement process. The team is uh, really working hard to support uh, each of our buildings uh, towards higher levels of achievement and to ensure both scholar and educator success. Um, I too wanted to just say thank you to Stark State College and our CCAA team uh, for a really exciting um, celebration on Friday as we are uh, rounding third and um, and coming home to really finalize all of the sister partnership agreements. I think we have one left and, uh, and that is well underway of being finalized that we will have that final school sister partner um, for, for our scholars. Uh, but just want to thank the team. It's always a great day when we can celebrate the accomplishments of our young people, but also celebrate uh, deepening those those relationships. Um, as well, um, this week, in terms of persons who are in the community who really want to more actively engage uh, with the district around supporting our scholars, um, myself and Dr. Akbar had the opportunity to be at the NAACP meeting uh, last week, and really, uh, many of the different organizations are asking questions of how can I help and uh, we've been talking with them a lot about the presence you know um, and having persons be uh, visibly present especially uh, we're focusing on our middles and so our middle schools uh, and some of our high schools uh, could really use mentors or persons to come in uh, have lunch with our young men especially so uh, there are some exciting things to come, but do want to just raise the fact that the NAACP uh, was uh, fully in the house for um, their their first in-person meeting and um, spent that time focused on wanting to hear more about how equity our initiative is unfolding in the district and wanting to better support the young people of our, our great city. Um, we've also in the district just completed um, the identification of uh, the teachers of the year uh, for uh, this school year and uh, many of who have been named and are beginning to be celebrated. So more to come with that because we will have a beautiful celebration. Uh, but we, we are proud of our educators who are have distinguished themselves amongst, amongst the crowd. Um, also, too, uh, today uh, brought uh, a beautiful visual view if you're, you know, kind of looked out of your window early this morning, but it also piqued the interest. So um, it started those uh, great emails and things like that about remind me uh, what are the conditions at which, you know, school might close because of the weather. So, Deborah, you, you know how exciting that can be. Um, so, just a reminder um, that one of the things. I think we are great at is communicating about inclement weather and so should there be uh, the need for that and today was not by far uh, one of those days so I know it was kind of one of our first but um, we we were able to move about with ease um, we, we do want to remind families and to remind the board that we uh, we do use multiple ways to make sure everyone is clear about our status, everything from using every media outlet, radio, TV, Facebook, you know, things of that nature, to also doing the all calls. And so um, we're perfectly alert, you know, now that we're in the thick of those winter months. Um, but we just want to remind persons there really won't be a need to email to ask. Uh, they, they will know uh, very clearly should we be in, in that position. 
Um, lastly, I will just say that uh, we are in the second semester, um, which is always a nice time to focus on the work at hand. Uh, but one of the t things that it also brings is a new opportunity for our scholars who did not get engaged in after school opportunities during the first part of the year to take advantage of opportunities during this part of the year. So we have brand new sets of um, enrollments, but so if, if there is any interest whatsoever, whether it be sports or cooking or uh, creative writing or robotics, uh, gaming, things of that nature, we do uh, have a wide array of after school offerings for our young people and are trying to cultivate an environment where people see that as a natural extension to their day, that they go to school for the first part of the day and then they enrich themselves and get engaged in, in their passions or interest in the evening. So uh, just want to remind uh, the board as you are out and about engaging that you remind persons with children or wherever you have the opportunity to represent APS that we have a wide set of offerings with seats available and we just really want to take advantage while we have the resource uh, to be able to provide that for our young people. Okay, that, that concludes my report. All right, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Um, next we go to President's report. Um, so I, I too have been in, in buildings um, and, um, and I just wanna call out that I continue to hear concern about cell phones. Uh, and um, you hear it from educators and uh, almost every teacher I talk to, um, you know, calls out cell phones and the distraction that it creates um, and the potential for conflict between teachers and students, um, i.e. when teachers ask a student to put it away or, you know, God forbid, try to take it from them um, or ask for it. Um, and so I know that we've had conversations before about about cell phones, um, and so we've we've come to the point where um, you know I think this board, I think this organization, this team um, has got to begin to move the ball forward on how we address it because uh, it, it's has it it's been an issue for a while. Um, and so I know the next board meeting is in three weeks, um, but in in three weeks' time, you know, just to telegraph this a bit, one of the things that we'll be adding to the agenda is a conversation around cell phones. We, we've got to begin um, talking about solutions. Um, I know we have a board policy around cell phones. You know, um, you know, I'll ask that 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 that, that committee also review that particular policy uh, and have. Um, and have some commentary uh, ready for in time, ready um, for the next board meeting, um, because again, we've got to have a conversation about that. Um, I think what gets lost in translation is the urgency of what happens in our buildings on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, um, you know, I, I am not in the buildings, but I know that teachers are, and every single day, they're dealing with it. Now, my job is one where I don't have to deal with it. Right, and so, so I think that what I'm, what I really want to do is work to align uh, our urgency uh, with that of the people who are in the classrooms. Um, and so, uh, again, so that's that will be something that will be on. I'll be adding to the agenda for the uh, our next board meeting, which I which I believe is in three weeks. And so, my request is the the board policy committee um, begin to discuss that policy there first. Uh, these are live stream meetings, and the public is 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 welcome to attend. Um, you know, so uh, insofar as there are teachers or parents or administrators that would like to provide input, uh, whether it be in emails to the superintendent or the, or the board, um, you know, or to that committee, um, you know, our ears are open, and um, and the time is now um, to to do something about it. Um, so that's my first thought, first comment. Uh, yeah, yes, please, Ms. Jackson. Um, Mr. President, I think it will be um, even advantageous. I'm glad that you said something to the committee. Um, basically, when we meet to just 
be dealing with solutions because I think we talked we've talked at length we've yes. been presented at length from community members substitutes um, I have um, emails full of suggestions um, from people about um, things that they think could help. So that's the conversation as far as what are recommendations and then superintendent, what is really applicable within the classroom? What can we actually do mm -hmm. to correct the problem? Mm -hmm. I think because um, I don't know necessarily that we even need a meeting to talk at length about mm -hmm. cell phones being a problem. I think that's been clearly identified. Mm -hmm. So now it's if we've identified it as a problem, I would hope the next time we meet, we're meeting to then reason about solutions, what's applicable, what's not, what we can do, when, how can we roll this out, what, where are the teachers at on this? Because a lot of my emails are from teachers, some were from parents with some ideas and some solutions. So I just want to throw that out just for the Agreed. sake of, yep, totally I just agree. don't want to be in a meeting talking about cell phones being a problem because we already know that. Yep. Timing is great too. So mm -hmm. um, there, that. Uh, the team will be able to share uh, those recommendations. And in fact, as we speak, we have a team who is uh, traveling to another uh, district um, along with the president of AEA um, to look at options that are being used in other places and things of that nature. So there's quite a bit of uh, gathering of ideas in addition to stronger enforcement of the uh, cell phone policies that have been in place, um, you know, so there are what other ideas or strategies might be used. So there are a number that have been identified. Sure. Yeah, and I think there are tools that we can use to help make the policy more enforceable, right? I mean, so it's not just as simple as, as asking a teacher or saying to a teacher, do your job, enforce the policy, take the phone from the kid. That's just not, I think we all know that's, that's not realistic. Um, you know, and so thinking about what kinds of tools we can create um, for to help assist people in being able to enforce a policy. Um, you know, and, and I know I've had talks with a couple of you on this topic. You know, the policies that currently is written. Um, you know, honestly, it's 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 not a poorly written policy. You know, it's I think it's fairly well written as a policy. It, it could probably use some tweaks and some updating, um, but it's it's a policy that really is. Um, the policy is not the problem, I don't think, you know. But again, insofar as we can work through that process you know, to make improvements to that policy, I think that's where that conversation is important. I'm sorry, Ms. Vice President. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, you know, and I think you already did, I want to make sure that uh, teachers are looking to their peers for solutions mm -hmm. um, through my hundreds and probably thousands of hours of volunteer mm -hmm. service in the buildings you know I've witnessed and seen teachers with successful um, ways of dealing with the mm -hmm. cell phone um, in their classroom mm -hmm. so um, for those of you who might be listening you know send us those ideas mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna also say that um, I would challenge anybody in this room to say that we're not all addicted to cell phones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that. Mm -hmm. um, there's other countries who already have rehab facilities for stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We're behind. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just remember, whatever we're going to try to decide for our students, That's right. this is a issue in the country. Um, and so I just also um, wanted to say again, um, we have some things in place that are successful already. Let's lean on that. Um, and, and hugely, we need to be considerate of these families who are the ones who buy these cell phones for their students and pay for these plans. They definitely have to be at the forefront of whatever we decide. We can sit around this table all day long and decide what we think is best. But you know, parents, families have their various reasons for their students having these cell phones. Some of those reasons are because of certain climate issues in the buildings, and they want to be able to feel safe. So have to include families in these conversations um, because they're paying these bills. Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. wanted to add that. Thank you. Mr. Perry. Yeah, just, just a brief word on this issue. I mean, actually, uh, uh, I want to give a shout out to Mr. Merge at uh, Litchfield, one of my, my, seventh year, my seventh graders' uh, teachers. He challenged him this past week to give up his cell phone for a day. And it worked, apparently. So I, I forgot to do that around the house, because he did it the entire day. And, and he had no phone at school, and I was so proud of him. So shout out to Mr. Merge at Litchfield, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Perry. Um, Mr. Alexander, sure, yep. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I would encourage all of us too to read the, read the policy, read the administrative guidelines that goes with it. And, and I want to say it's about policy too. Um, we can develop any policy that we want to develop, but if it's not followed, it's not enforced, it's no good if people aren't following it. I mean, the, the, I said this before when the gentleman, uh, Mr. Smith, came and spoke to us about cell phones, that we have a cell phone policy. But what are we doing? Is, is, is anybody following that policy? Uh, it was a policy that was written, so we're developing policy for people to follow. But who all is following it? Are the kids following it? Are the staff following it? Is anybody following it? If they're not following it, what's good, what good is the policy? So we got to have a policy that people will follow. And if we're going to have a policy, we got to make sure that everybody follows the policy. If not, it's no good. And it sounds like that the policy was written, but there are not people who are enforcing the policy. And I've said that before, too. I've been in schools where teachers said to me, I'm glad you said something about a cell phone. And I'm saying to myself, why am I the one who's just walking into a building saying something about the cell phone when it should be those individuals who are in the, in the, in the school? So that's why I want to say, no matter what policy we have, we need to make sure the policy is going to be followed and make sure it's, it's followed. Because I think we could build upon the current policy we have yet. Yeah, it, it does need to be looked at again, but we need to make sure that when it is put together that we just say we don't have a policy but a policy that's enforced and i'll keep saying enforce 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 because no policy is worth anything unless it's enforced and, and it's, it's followed thank you mm -hmm. thank you Ms. Alexander. yeah miss jackson um thank you for that mr alexander because i i'm a strong believer in policy um driving decisions and supporting decisions made because when you have a written policy and then you take an action, the policy supports that action, right? So I had a very interesting interaction with the teacher. And she, her, and she was not being rude, she just really stated the facts. And she said to me simply, Ms. Jackson, have you ever had a student cuss you out for trying to take their cell phone? And I said, well, no, ma'am, I never have. Have you ever had a student like get to where you almost think they may try to jump on you because you say something to them about their cell phone? I said, absolutely not. She said, well, welcome to this world because that's what some right. teachers are experiencing. Yeah. And so, um, Ms. Autry, when you talk about to look at their colleagues, you know, relationships vary and they matter. Some teachers, I don't have that problem in my building because I'm at a private Christian sh school and the standard is the standard. Mm -hmm. Parents pay for phones or not. I'm taking the phone, a parent has to retrieve it, and if it becomes habitual, your child is suspended. It's real simple, right, for me. But that's been the standard, non-deviated, no interruptions. So now you get into the, our district, a larger district, where you may be like that. You may adhere to the cell phone policy, so no one would ever try you. You've been at this school for 20 years, and they know no cell phones in your room because you've been consistent. Mm -hmm. Another teacher may not have those relationships or the confidence to enforce the policy. Yes, the policy is there, but things still happen within that mm -hmm. to where if you don't feel safe to approach someone concerning a policy um, or maybe support it and when you try to enforce that policy, then now we have all these gray areas. Right, right. So I just want to really mention that when we talk about enforcing um, policies or even with parents. You know, so just this can be a, this is something we can go into deeper, but even, you know, I said to someone, and not everyone doesn't have to agree, we all have opinions, right? And I said, well, you know, people had diabetes, people had seizures before there were cell phones, and we've had public schools, mm -hmm. right? Because people say, well, my child needs it because there was a time where every child didn't have. So what was the standard operating procedure then? Mm -hmm. You see, as long as we give excuses and take them, people will um, lean to them. So I think this is for another, I know, a day and further discussion, but I just couldn't just let that be said. Like, oh, it's like the policy is just not trying to be enforced. It's the climate we're in. Mm -hmm. If they don't respect their parents in some cases, you think they're going to respect the teacher that asks for a phone? Mm -hmm. So it's those type of things to consider. See, and that's why we have to have a, a policy that we can, people are willing to follow and they don't feel threatened possibly and so forth. So we have to look at look at those policies because I mean every organization that you have have policies and they expect them to be followed. You know, we can't go to our jobs and, and uh, the policy is, is not being enforced. If it's not enforced, then we'll be called to the administrative office and then something is there. Just, and like you said, when we, when we didn't have cell phones, how do we handle certain situations? So there's a lot of things that need to be, uh, could be discussed, but you know, we do have to come up with a solution because there are some individuals that are afraid to say some things to, to students, and I, I can understand that. Uh, 
so we, we have we have a lot some things that, that it, not just us as the board but others too I mean we need to bring some teachers in and, and possibly some community to say okay what is going to be the best possible solution that have a policy that we can follow and people would not be afraid to follow Madam please Superintendent. say one final oh, okay. thing yes and so I know everyone giggled in the room when I said addiction but when you think about drug addiction, when you think about other types of addiction, you see people behave outside of their normal personality. I've seen the meekest and mildest of children turn into the incredible hawk mm -hmm. if you try to take that phone. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be prepared because this is a different animal. This is not going to be solved by a simple policy. It's not going to be solved by a simple, well, this is just the way it is. Because you're going to see these behaviors manifest themselves. And there's consequences for behavior. There's absolutely consequences. But when there's an addiction involved, it's not as simple as that, especially when you're dealing with children at a certain developmental level mm -hmm. anyway. So this is just an added layer of challenge. So we just need to keep that in mind when we're making these decisions moving forward. Okay. Madam Superintendent. Uh, I agree. And so I, I guess one of the things I just wanted to offer was uh, some hope uh, because, <laughs> you know, in this, um, we, we do have a, uh, a decent policy, you know. So uh, we as a team pulled out the policy the other day and was looking it over the administrative guidelines. And there might still be some tweaks that need to be made to the policy. But um, part of what we talked a lot about is to what degree are we consistent? And this is not pointing the finger at anyone, you know, because again, our theory of action says it's all of us that gets things done. So it's really saying collective we, uh, to what degree are we consistent in uh, reinforcing our expectations? To what degree are there ways in which, in today's environment, uh, there are ways in which you can use cell phones for good, uh, for you know, because they there are many computers, you know, too. So, um, so it's really thinking through that range, thinking through uh, if we get to this all or nothing. I think we are going to get into a tug of war. But um, if we really think about how we can invite students to really work with us and you know with with all of uh, the different um, roles also playing their part. We arrived at MASK. You know, masks were something that we, uh, people didn't like, they didn't appreciate it, it made us uncomfortable, but when it mattered, you know, we were able to come together and to ensure safety, and in this regard, to ensure um, a conducive learning environment. I just think part of the effort has to be how do we come together with families, with, with our scholars, um, to really just uh, set a tone for how we need our, our school buildings to be. So I think there's hope. We've seen it in other places where we've pulled together and sent collective clear messages. So I think that's well said, Superintendent. Um, and so, uh, well, that was the most lively president's report I think we've ever had. Um, so um, I'm that it's, too long, it's no longer the president's report, it's the board report. I'm, I'm going to change that one. Um, so yeah, so the last thing, so the last thing I'll say is uh, appreciate the, the commentary and the thoughtful remarks. Um, I just would want to emphasize again as, as, as we close out the president's report that um, urgency um, is imperative here. Um, I think um, we have spent enough time talking about it. Um, so urgency is the, is the word. So, uh, and that, with that, I will conclude the President's report and we'll move next to the Treasurer's report. Mr. Atkins. Um, no report tonight. Okay, no report. Uh, we'll go to committee reports, uh, legal policy and contracts. Oh, we are missing two board members. Okay, so we're going to go. Um, so I'm gonna speak, I'll speak for Dr. Akbar, no report. Um, we'll go next to Finance Committee. Thank you so much. Um, we will be having our first Finance Committee, I believe, next Monday. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to uh, jumping in and, and, you know, addressing uh, the things that we need to address financially in this district, you know, um, and us. Levy is part of that. I said I will be keeping that conversation on the forefront because um, that's a responsible thing to do. Okay. So I look forward to reporting out in the near future. Roger that. 
Thank you, Ms. Autry. Uh, next, we go to instructional policy and curriculum. I believe that's you, Mr. Alexander. We don't have a report, but we are scheduled to meet on uh, February the 6th. Okay. And equity, uh, I know that board chair is not here. Um, I'm sure that chair is not here, so I'll, so some new, new report. I have seen the emails. I know all these meetings are being scheduled, um, so, that, so I'll, I'll share that much. Um, next, we'll move to, uh, is there any new business for the board? No new business, okay. Uh, so we do not need, there is no need to adjourn into executive session, um, sorry, recess into executive session, so I will take a motion for uh, adjournment. I so move. Second. It's been, it's been okay. It's been uh, probably moved by uh, Mr. Perry and seconded by uh, Vice President Autry. Uh, is there any discussion? Okay, roll call please. Mr. Atkins. Ms. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Alexander. Yes. Ms. Autry. Yes. Mr. Perry. Yes. Dr. Hall. Aye. Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned.